morning. morning. Great. It's exciting to be here once again. And uh, it's a great opportunity to listen to Professor Harvey Lodish. Today's um, topic is of particular interest to me because in my lifetime, I've seen at least three close friends who have died of sickle cell disease. So efforts that have been put in place to find cure to them, it's are topics that I am always interested in listening to. Today, Harvey is going to talk to us about the ex vivo gene therapies for sickle cell disease and beta thalassemias. I don't think I need to introduce Professor Harvey Lodish. We've heard, we've heard from him since Monday. So let's just go straight to the point and welcome Professor Lodish. slides in the right I want the slides on the screen not my face <laughs> ah perfect thank you so much Well, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to talk with you about these amazing discoveries, most of which have happened in or around Boston. Um, as some of you know, I've been on the board of trustees of Boston Children's Hospital, where a great deal of this gene therapy work is being done. And I've had the privilege of knowing not only many of the doctors and researchers who have done the work, but I've seen and talked with several of the young people who have been treated with sickle cell gene therapy and quite amazingly are living perfectly normal lives. So I'd like to discuss with you several of the ongoing research largely but not entirely in Boston and in companies based in Boston. I'll start by talking about some of the basics of sickle cell disease and another disease, genetic disease equally widespread called beta thalassemia, which results in a loss of expression of beta globin one of the two components of hemoglobin. I combine the two because many of the gene therapies being developed for one disease are applicable to the other. I'll talk about hematopoietic stem cells and stem cell transplants because currently all of the gene therapies for sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia are done ex vivo, where the hematopoietic, the blood-forming stem cells, are taken from the patient and treated in the laboratory, ex vivo as we call it, with one or another reagent that should correct or replace the genetic defect in sickle cell disease. The patient's bone marrow is then treated to remove their endogenous stem cells. And then the reconstituted stem cells are reapplied. I'll go into this in some detail. As you will recognize and probably know, this is a complicated, expensive technology. And I'll come near the end with newer technologies that are being developed that hopefully will not require a stem cell transplant. I'll talk at some length about the transition from fetal to adult life of the beta globins, the transition from fetal globin 
fetal hemoglobin to adult hemoglobin. And the role of a protein called BCL11A that is a repressor of fetal globin synthesis. The reason is fetal globin inhibits the, syn I'm sorry, BCL11A, as we'll see, inhibits the synthesis of fetal hemoglobin and is a major part of the reason that fetal hemoglobin is turned off at birth. Inhibiting BCL11A, as you'll see, allows fetal hemoglobin to be made throughout adult life, reversing many of the negative effects of sickle cell anemia. And as you can see uh, from some of the details I will go into, knocking down or inhibiting BCL11A is a key aspect of sickle cell and beta thalassemia gene therapies. The gene therapies I'll discuss are of two types. One is using retroviruses, viruses such as HIV, as vehicles for introducing the gene into these isolated hematopoietic stem cells. More recently, this is being superseded by electroporation of CRISPR proteins that induce positive types of gene therapy. So you get a sense that this is a developing field Several of the gene therapies that I will discuss have been, <coughs> <coughs> have been already approved by the FDA, including one using a lentiviral vector by Bluebird. So it's a fast developing field. The good news is the clinical trials are very promising. And many young people, and in fact adults, have been cured. I hate to use the word cured, but it looks like they have been cured of sickle cell disease. So just some basics to remind you, we're dealing with red blood cells, which are the major cell type in the human body. They are seven micrometer flexible biconcave discs. They can squeeze through capillaries much smaller than seven micrometers. And this is important because when the red cells sickle, they get caught in capillaries. And as we'll see, this causes many of the aspects of the disease, including the excruciating pain. Red cells also last 120 days, and also, as many of you know, they're an essential host for the malaria parasite. We'll be talking about hemoglobin, which, to remind you, consists of two alpha chains and two beta chains, each of which has a heme group with an iron. And the role of hemoglobin, of course, is to transport oxygen from the blood, from the lungs through the blood to peripheral tissues, and then carbon dioxide back to the lungs for exhalation. So the disease itself, and I'll talk about both of them, are the two most widespread genetic diseases in the world's human population. As many of you know, sickle cell disease largely affects malaria-rich areas of sub-Saharan Africa. Beta thalassemia mainly affects South Asia, but also other malaria zones. The mutation in sickle cell disease is one amino acid in the beta chain, position six, if I recall, that changes a GAG glutamic acid codon to a GTG valine codon. 
the A to T change becomes important because the base editing technology that's been developed that I will discuss can change a purine A into a G, but it is unable to change it to a T. So base editing becomes problematic for this specific disease. And again, to remind you, this mutation, when the red cells are exposed to low oxygen, as happens in the peripheral tissues during circulation, the sickle hemoglobin will polymerize, forming rod-like structures that deforms the red cell into a rigid sickle shape that is unable to be flexible and therefore gets stuck very often in capillaries. And what are called vasoocclusive crises are caused by this deoxygenated sickle-shaped red blood cells. They obstruct flow to capillaries re resulting in oxygen deprivation, pain, tissue necrosis, often organ damage, and particularly early death. And both diseases, beta thalassemia and sickle cell disease, exist in populations because the heterozygotes, those with one copy of the sickle mutation and one wild type copy, or one copy of a beta thalassemia knockdown of, of the beta chain and one wild type. They're usually asymptomatic, but red cells from these patients tend to resist the growth of the malaria parasite. And that's why it's accumulated. The heterozygotes accumulate in the population. And as a consequence, when two heterozygotes have children, on average, one or four, one out of four, would have the sickle cell disease. The United States has been the country where most of the therapeutic drugs have been developed. And it's taken years, sadly, for funding for research on sickle cell disease to be increased. As an example, in the United States, roughly 100,000 individuals have sickle cell disease. Approximately 30,000 have a different disease, cystic fibrosis, which mainly affects descendants of Northern Europeans. As you can see quickly, you see which disease of the two has been most generously funded, uh, both from the federal government, roughly three times as much per capita funding goes to cystic fibrosis than to sickle cell disease. There are no large foundations in the United States that until recently supported research on sickle cell disease. And it's taken a long time to develop even the few drugs that have emerged in modern times. Hydroxyurea, which also induces fetal hemoglobin, has been the mainstay of therapy for a number of years. Recently, two drugs have been developed and are in clinical use for sickle cell disease. They treat the symptoms of the disease, not the underlying cause. This drug, which I can never pronounce, I think it's Voxelator. How people get weird names for drugs, I don't know. But it's a, pro it's a small molecule that binds irreversibly to the amino terminal residue in alpha globin. Sickle cell, the oxygen level in the red cell doesn't drop sufficiently to induce polymerization. 
and it works rather nicely in some patients, but not all. More recently, a monoclonal antibody was developed that blocks the adhesion of sickle red cells to endothelial cells. Um, the protein P-selectin is normally found in storage granules, not on the surface of endothelial cells. Induced by the inflammatory process that sickle cell disease causes, P-selectin appears on the surface of endothelial cells and participates in the adhesion of the sickle cells, causing the vaso-occlusion. So this drug, which again I can't pronounce, um, is a monoclonal antibody that in some patients, but not all, will reduce the pain crises in sickle cell disease. Before I go on, I just want to briefly introduce beta thalassemia, almost the twin of sickle cell disease which is a different cause. It's loss of function of one of the two beta globin genes that we have. And it causes an anemia. It results in ineffective red cell formation, chronic destruction of red cells. And again, it's most prevalent in Mediterranean and South and Southeast Asian populations. And again, beta thalassemia occurs in many millions of people, tens of thousands of deaths per year. Loss of function in the beta globin gene can occur at many positions in the gene. The disease results in severe anemia, fail to gain weight, failure to thrive, and so forth. And the only existing treatments for this disease are regular blood transfusions because of the severe anemia. The complication is the iron that is delivered to the patient as part of the therapy, the transfusion. It accumulates, and if not treated with iron chelating agents and excreted, will cause heart failure and other problems. And the other solution is bone marrow transplants. So you see both of these widespread diseases of erythroid cells require gene therapy treatment. The basis of the treatments we will discuss are hematopoietic stem cells. And I call your attention to this cell on the left, the hematopoietic stem cell. Our bodies have, you know, 100,000 to a million of these cells. These cells live in niches in the bone marrow, as I'll show you. When they divide, on average, one of the daughters remains a stem cell. And the other daughter will divide multiple times, differentiate along one of the many pathways shown here, and give rise to all of the red and white blood cells in our body, as well as all of the cells of the immune system. And many cytokines and other molecules stimulate these cell divisions and cause certain of the cells to be made at appropriate times. But the key is the stem cell because the gene therapies that we will discuss are done on the stem cell. These cells and their descendants live for the lifetime of a mouse or of a human. So a stem cell transplant correcting the sickle cell or beta thalassemia mutation should last for the lifetime of an individual. 
and so far, as you'll see, the results are encouraging. There is a niche in the bone marrow comprised of cells adjacent to the blood cells that attracts these hematopoietic stem cells. Cells in the bone marrow release cytokines, such as stem cell factor, SCF, that appear on the surface of these cells. And by binding to a hematopoietic stem cell, interacting with the receptor for SCF, a protein tyrosine kinase, sends signals that control the behavior of these stem cells and contribute to their immortality. So we are talking about bone marrow transplants, which require extensive medical facilities. First, the patient would be treated with a drug, usually um, colony stimulating factor, which mobilizes the stem cells from the bone marrow into the blood. The blood is passed through a column, which has on it monoclonal antibodies that bind to the receptor, the CD117, and pull the stem cells and other progenitors out. So this results in harvesting of the stem cells. Then the patient is treated with a toxic drug, such as the one shown here, to clear out the rest of the bone marrow so that the new stem cells either from a donor or the gene-corrected stem cells from the patient, can be reintroduced. And then that takes several weeks. Eventually, the patient receives the donor stem cells or the genetically modified stem cells. And it takes, because you destroy the immune system of the patient, it takes about three weeks for this immune system to recover where the new stem cells generate the daughter immune and white blood cells, which means the patient must be kept in a germ-free environment for about three weeks. A problem with donor stem cells is graft-versus-host disease, where immune cells that contaminate invariably the stem cells from a donor attack the recipient stem cells, even with matches. And this opens the way, as it were, for correction of the patient's own hematopoietic stem cells by gene therapy. So here we're talking about extraction of the patient's hematopoietic stem cell. There is no donor search, clearly no chance of graft-versus-host disease, and the patient is corrected. The disease should be corrected and is corrected. So before I go into the gene therapies, I need to give you some insight into this remarkable protein BCL11A. I'm looking at several hundred of you in the audience. I'm just curious, a show of hands, how many of you have ever heard of BCL11A? I don't see any hands. Okay, you're going to learn a lot about it, and you're going to love it. So, I need to introduce to you the beta globin locus, a section of chromosomes that encodes several beta chains. The alpha chain in adult hemoglobin is ubiquitous. All of the proteins, all of the hemoglobins I'm going to talk about have the same alpha chain. That doesn't change. What changes during our lifetimes 
is the beta globin chain in hemoglobin. Early in our embryonic lives, we express the epsilon beta globin gene. And the hemoglobin that is formed would be alpha 2 epsilon 2. During the majority of fetal life, the major hemoglobins that are made consist of one of the two gamma chains, that is alpha 2, gamma 2. The G gamma and A gamma chains essentially make the same protein. So fetal hemoglobin, alpha 2, gamma 2, is made in fetal life. During, the, during birth, around birth, the expression of fetal hemoglobin, alpha 2, gamma 2, goes down, and the adult hemoglobin, alpha 2, beta 2, goes up. What's important is that the sickle mutation is in the adult beta globin. That is, sickle cell disease does not appear until weeks after birth when enough of the alpha-2, beta, S2 hemoglobins accumulate. Also important on this diagram, and it figures in later, there is what is called a locus control region. It is what is termed molecularly a super enhancer. It's a segment of DNA that binds multiple transcription factors and opens the chromatin, but only in cells that will become erythroid cells. Put another way, the locus control element determines that the genes downstream of it are expressed only in erythroid progenitor cells, not in other cells. In non-erythroid cells, that region of the chromatin is closed, it's heterochromatin, and transcription factors cannot reach it. I stress this point because if you're going to do gene therapy and induce hemoglobin, you only want the hemoglobin made in erythroid cells. You don't want immune cells making hemoglobin. And we'll come to that. What has led the work leading to BCL11A is this clinical result that's almost 50, uh, 30 years old. That is, it was shown clinically that individuals who maintain a high level of fetal hemoglobin during their adult life, where greater than 8.6% of the hemoglobin is fetal hemoglobin, those individuals do much better with sickle cell disease and also beta thalassemia than those who have much lower levels of fetal hemoglobin. And the thought then was that the more fetal hemoglobin that persists in adult red cells, the, they would compete with the hemoglobin S and <coughs> prevent or restrict the sickling that would otherwise occur. Remember, sickling are caused by polymers of the alpha-2, beta, S sickle hemoglobin. But having large numbers of fetal hemoglobin in there would prevent these long fibrils of hemoglobin from forming. So this precipitated an enormous worldwide effort to understand what it is that causes adults to have higher or lower levels of fetal hemoglobin, or for that matter, what normally causes the switch from fetal to adult hemoglobin. And the question is, 
why do some individuals, both normal and with sickle cell disease, maintain a higher than normal level of fetal hemoglobin as adults? And to this end, what is called a genome-wide association study was done, looking for polymorphisms throughout the entire human genome, both in individuals with sickle cell disease and normal adults of all racial and ethnic backgrounds. And what transpired were three loci in the human genome that affected fetal globin expression in adult individuals. One was in the beta globin gene cluster, and I won't go there. The second is the MIB gene, which also regulates the fetal globin transition. And then this totally new protein called BCL11A that had been studied for its role in other cells, and I'll come to that, but never in red cells. And what transpired through a great deal of biochemical studies was that BCL11A is a DNA binding protein that represses the synthesis of gamma globin gene. In other words, it's a repressor of fetal globin gene expression. Just one example because I followed this work very closely, they mated a sickle cell disease mouse, a mouse that had human hemoglobin, sickle hemoglobin, with a mouse that lacks BCL11A, and the sickling went away. So a lot of work went into understanding BCL11A and its regulation. So just bear with me. It is intricate, but it's crucial to understanding much of the current work in sickle cell gene therapy. First of all, this genetic pleiotropy, some of us have higher levels of BCL11A and lower levels of fetal hemoglobin, some of us the converse. There seems to be no pathological relevance to this at all. BCL11A also plays key roles in nerve development and B lymphocyte development. So the objective then is to inhibit synthesis of BCL11A only in developing erythroid cells so that high levels of fetal hemoglobin, gamma globin, are made and thus reverse the negative effects of sickle cell disease. And workers at Boston Children's Hospital zeroed in on an 80 base pair sequence upstream of the BCL11A gene called the erythroid enhancer, a sequence of 80 base pairs that determines the level of BCL11A expression in developing red cells. In normal individuals, some BCL11A protein is made. It represses gamma globin synthesis, and there's low expression of hemoglobin F. As I said, there are natural mutations where less BCL11A is made. This is the pleiotropy and you make more hemoglobin F. But if you delete or inactivate the enhancer altogether, you make a lot of fetal hemoglobin, and uh, you would ameliorate all the effects of hemoglobin S. And near the end of this talk, I'll show you a paper. It's the first one where CRISPR, the RNA-guided nuclease has been used to cut out the BCL11A erythroid enhancer and turn on fetal hemoglobin. 
I'll come to that because that may be one of the ultimate gene therapies for sickle cell disease. The current gene therapies, the ones that are approved, all involve retroviral vectors for stem cell gene therapy using a virus now almost entirely HIV. We call them lentiviruses. If you tell a patient you're going <coughs> to get HIV gene therapy, they're going to freak out. So we had to change the name from HIV virus to lentivirus, which sounds less innocuous. In fact, as you'll see, the vectors have none of the HIV genes, and they simply have the therapeutic genes. We'll come to that. The problem is these viruses can cause tumors, as you well know with HIV. And in fact, gene therapy with these viruses was done 20 years ago. And it was extraordinarily successful. They were using it for a disease I'll come to in a moment called X-linked severe combined immune deficiency, where a key protein in the immune system is missing. And that gene, the interleukin-2 receptor gamma chain, was introduced using retroviral vectors. And 20 infants were cured they develop normal immune systems, and I'll show you that. But five of the 20 later developed leukemia and one died. And that put a hold on this kind of gene therapy for almost 20 years. So it required a lot of work, which I'll describe, to figure out how to use these viruses as gene therapy vehicles without causing cancers. So these viruses, here's the structure of a typical virus. It contains two molecules of the RNA. And two molecules, you can see it in green, of the protein called reverse transcriptase. This is surrounded by a capsid protein. And the entire virus is surrounded by a membrane that contains glycoproteins that fuse the virus with target cells. And the life cycle of a retrovirus is fairly straightforward. You can see on the top the virus with its two red RNAs, the reverse transcriptase, the virus binds to the membrane of the host cell, fuses with it, and releases the nucleocapsid into the cell cytoplasm. The nucleocapsid releases the viral RNA, and the RNA is copied into viral DNA by reverse transcriptase. So you have in the cytoplasm double-stranded DNA that is a copy of the viral RNA. The viral DNA moves into the nucleus and will insert itself randomly into the genomic DNA. And this is important because if you insert the viral DNA into a hematopoietic stem cell, into the genome of the hematopoietic stem cell, it's going to be there for the life of the stem cell, which is the life of the organism. And that RNA, excuse me, that DNA will, of course, be transcribed into viral RNA. Some of the viral RNA will remain as genomic RNA in the daughter viruses. Some of it will be used to synthesize as messenger RNA the viral capsid proteins, the envelope proteins, and so on, making a virus that is budded from the cell. And again, 
the virus binds to surface proteins on the cell surface. These are well characterized for viruses such as HIV and so forth. What is shown here is the viral DNA that is inserted into the cell chromosome. And in the middle are the viral genes, gag, hall, and envelope. The coding sequences for the capsid protein, reverse transcriptase, and the envelope. HIV will have other proteins that we don't need to go into. But what is relevant here are the so-called long terminal repeat sequences because these drive both transcription of the viral RNA. And as you can see in the blue line, the genome is transcribed from the so-called R and U5 sequences through the gag pollen M gene. And this is driven by the U3 enhancer, which is a powerful enhancer promoting transcription of the retroviral genome. The problem is it's an enhancer sequence, and it can promote not only downstream transcription of the viral RNA, but it can also promote transcription of upstream genes. And if the virus happens to insert near an oncogene, it could turn on the oncogene with the enhancer and thus lead the cell towards a leukemic transformation. And that's what happened in the patients 20 years ago. So the modern retroviruses lack that U3 enhancer. Sounds trivial, but it took many years to figure out what's going on. And the final point before we get into the interesting stuff is how you make a retroviral vector. It's similar to what I described, if you were here the other day, for adeno-associated virus. Whoa. This plasmid on the left, it should be a continuous circle. The computer did something to it. But you have a plasmid that has the LTRs and the clone genes. You transfect a cell with that plasmid, and it will make the RNA, the retroviral RNA, instead of having gag pollen N, it will have your clone genes. But of course, you need gag pollen N to make a virus. So these are provided by other plasmids, which will express the gag and polymerase proteins, usually a separate plasmid to make the envelope protein. So to make a retroviral vector, is complicated cell engineering. You transfect three different plasmids into the same cell. Each of them make their RNA and protein product. But the only RNA that will get packaged is the one made with the LTRs at the end because that's where the packaging sequence is. That will make a retrovirus that can infect a daughter cell, ideally a hematopoietic stem cell, express the viral protein, express the viral RNA. Wait. The retroviral vector with its modified retroviral RNA will infect a daughter cell the retroviral RNA will get copied into DNA by the associated um, retroviral RNA DNA polymerase, reverse transcriptase, 
and that will insert into the cellular genome. So the new generation of viruses eliminates the U3 enhancer, and the gene to be expressed as gene therapy is transcribed through a promoter, which is not an enhancer, which is in the middle of the viral RNA. So let me move to the real successes. This is what you all want to hear. The first one is this lethal disease, severe combined immune deficiency. I don't know if you know this child, the so-called bubble boy child, who had this disease, who literally lived in an isolation chamber for the seven years of his life. He eventually succumbed to an, to an infection. Um, it's a disease in which few, if any, B or T or NK cells of the immune system are made. And it's caused by mutations in the gene for the so-called interleukin-2 receptor gamma chain, which is an essential subunit for receptors for cytokines of many types. Um, you can see the same receptor forms part of the IL-4 receptor. Uh, it's a whole set of these, IL-9, IL-16. And without the gamma chain, one has no immune system. And this modified retroviral vector was used successfully to treat a dozen or so patients in the initial clinical trials, and it should be close to approval right now. It's exactly what I described. It contains, it lacks the U3 enhancer. It has the so-called psi or RNA packaging sequence. It has a strong promoter for synthesis of the IL-2 receptor gamma chain gene, and it works. As I said, I frequently visit the wards at Boston Children's Hospital. I had the pleasure of meeting this little boy and his parents. And you can see the family history. They had, a, it's X-linked. I should have mentioned that. The disease is X-linked. So the women are carriers, and half of their sons would have the disease. The first child, the first sign of the disease was death from a routine immunization. Whatever the bacteria was, it was not constrained by the immune system, and the child died. The second child, the second boy, was healthy. The third was this baby. They had no bone marrow matches for a transplant, and he was enrolled at Children's Hospital. And this is now, he's now eight or nine years post-therapy, and he's perfectly fine. He will lead, he leads, and seemingly will lead a normal life. He's being monitored every year by his own physician in Argentina, collaboratively with Children's Hospital, to make sure he does not have any leukemias and is otherwise healthy. But you can see, this was given to me in the very early, uh, result from the very early clinical trials, the fact that these children had no T cells and the T cells appeared within three, three months of gene therapy. So that is the kind of first pass at hematopoietic stem cell gene therapy. I'll now come with all this background to the approved FDA gene therapy 
using a lentiviral vector to express actually not a normal beta globin gene, but a sickle resistant beta globin gene. And again, I remind you that the locus control element is the enhancer that allows the downstream genes to be made only in erythroid cells. So this vector is considerably more complicated. Again, it has a, an LTR sequence that is missing the U3 enhancer. And it has another promoter that from the plasmid will induce synthesis of the downstream RNA. The RNA will contain a packaging sequence. Because it's a lentivirus, it will have a Rev responsive sequence that will enhance the transport of the message from the nucleus to the cytoplasm. The main part of the vector is at the right. It contains segments of the locus control element so that the downstream gene, it's being read from right to left, the downstream gene will be made only in erythroid progenitor cells. The gene itself is a normal beta globin gene with its normal two intron. It contains a mutation of a threonine to a uh, glutamate, glutamine uh, that prevents sickling of beta globin. And the bottom line is it's been introduced into patients initially for beta thalassemia because these patients make no beta globin. And again, it's now, as I'll show you, been approved, but the results were very strong. Uh, this is taken directly from the New England Journal paper. That is, as I mentioned, beta thalassemic patients need regular transfusions. Most of the patients with different forms of the disease became transfusion independent. The concentration of hemoglobin started very low at 34 grams per deciliter and rose to a normal level of 80 to 137, normal or near normal levels. But more importantly, there was no lysis of the red blood cells and red cell formation was largely corrected this from an announcement by Bluebird Bio, which is located actually almost next door to my laboratory. They announced the FDA approval of this. Um, it was, I believe, 2022. Yes. So just a year ago, it was approved as a gene therapy. They have also tested it very successfully the same vector in patients with sickle cell disease. And the results, as you can see in the New England Journal, are very positive. So that's one approach that's been taken. A second developed at Children's uses the same lentiviral vector, but generating an inhibitory RNA, a small inhibitory RNA that inhibits expression of the BCL11A message. So to remind you, there are in cells inhibitory RNAs called microRNAs. They're 22 nucleotides long. They're made from longer progenitor RNAs that are cut by enzymes in the cell. They wind up as 22 nucleotide double-stranded RNAs, 
one strand binds into the cytoplasm to a protein complex called the risk complex, binds a target message, and leads to messenger RNA degradation. Experimentally, and I discussed this the other day, one can introduce experimentally similar double-stranded RNAs that are fully complementary to a target message and results in cleavage of that message. And again, it's the same process. They bind in the, in the complex and silence it. So what was made at Children's Hospital is a variant of the vector you just saw. But instead of expressing beta globin gene, it expresses a hairpin double-stranded RNA that contains an shRNA that will attack the BCL11A RNA. And because of the locus control elements, this protein, this RNA, will be made only in developing red cells. So what it does is mimic an endogenous microRNA, leads to lower levels of BCL11A message, and um, enhances the synthesis of beta globin. Again, the clinical results are extremely encouraging. There's a wonderful article I have my own students read in the New York Times about this young woman, Helen Obando, who was the first young person to receive this sickle cell anemia gene therapy. And it's really her story of going from excruciating pain, spending weeks in hospitals, missing school, couldn't go out in cold weather because of sickle crises to leading what is seemingly a normal life. She's now in college. And again, we hate to use the word cure, but she does appear to be cured. I had the pleasure, I, knew the, I know the physician who administered the trial. I know about the consent. Don't forget, she, as a minor, still had to approve her own gene therapy. And trying to talk to a, she was 15, as the physician Erica Esrick told me, it's not easy talking to a 15-year-old that you're going to be the first person in the world <laughs> to get a version of a HIV virus that's gonna cure your sickle cell disease. But Helen was very brave, agreed to it, her parents agreed to it, and the rest, as they say, is history. So let me end with where the work is going. And these are very promising results. There's some clinical evidence. We're not there yet, but these also suggest routes by which sickle cell gene therapy could be done outside of these clinical settings. And they involve isolation of the hematopoietic stem cells. But rather than using lentiviruses to induce genes, they use electroporation transient electric current to open the membranes of the stem cells, allowing molecules to enter, and using this technology to introduce CRISPR proteins, these RNA-guided nucleases that could be used as gene therapies. And the first one is very recent. It's electroporation of Cas9. This is an RNA-guided DNA nuclease and a guide RNA 
that targets the nuclease to guess what? The erythroid enhancer of BCL11A, stimulating the production of fetal gamma globin. Again, to remind you, if you delete experimentally in mice the enhancer, you have no BCL11A in red cells. You have it in the other cells. And you make high levels of fetal hemoglobin. Here is the recent brief report of a handful of patients uh, describing the positive results. They're talking about two patients, one with beta thalassemia, the other with sickle cell disease with positive results. So we're talking two patients. You will notice the work is done by CRISPR Therapeutics and Vertex Pharmaceuticals, which are two companies in Boston. So clearly this is one technology. If it is successful, it will become widely used because the process of manufacturing lentiviral vectors is very complicated. Another approach makes use of base editors developed in David Liu's lab at the Broad Institute to reverse the sickle mutation. And let me describe these RNA-guided base editors because they can do lots of cool stuff. What we're talking about is an enzyme called adenosine deaminase, DNA adenosine deaminase, which will convert an adenosine. It removes the six amino groups and converts it into an oxygen keto group. So it converts adenosine into the molecule called inosine, which base pairs like guanosine. And what David developed is CRISPR Cas9 with its guide RNA. But the Cas9 protein normally has two DNA nuclease sites that cut the DNA to which the guide RNA directs it. Those sites are mutated, so they are inactive. But what he also did is append to it an adenosine deaminase. So the idea is the guide RNA brings this CRISPR adenosine deaminase to a target site in the DNA, and therefore it will deaminate the nearby A residue and convert it to an inosine, which should pair like guanosine. And in fact, they did this with hemoglobin. As I said at the beginning, you cannot convert the valine back to the original amino acid, which is a glutamate. But what they can do and have done is convert the valine to an alanine, which generates something called hemoglobin macasai, which is a mutant hemoglobin but not pathogenic. And David and one of his companies are working on that Here's a recent article called Base Editing of Hematopoietic Stem Cells Rescues Sickle Disease in Mice. So far, so good. But we have talked about a number of these new molecular technologies <coughs> that can cure sickle cell disease in beta thalassemia but require stem cell transplants. The evolution of these CRISPR 
technologies may, and I'm now looking to the future, may change everything. Because all you need to do is introduce these proteins, either the wild type CRISPR to cut the enhancer to BCL11A or this base editor to reverse the hemoglobin uh, to hemoglobin monocyte. All you need to do is get these molecules into hematopoietic stem cells, and they'll do their job. So there is a huge amount of work, mostly in companies, to try to do this in vivo. I just put on one recent paper where they incorporate the CRISPR and the guide RNA in a lipid nanoparticle that has on its surface a monoclonal antibody, the CD117, which should target the lipid nanoparticle to a hematopoietic stem cell or early progenitor. The early results in mice are very promising. So here's, I'm sorry, this is the actual paper. It's in vivo, can you read it? Yeah, in vivo, gosh, it's deformed. I'll read it to you. In vivo hematopoietic stem cell modification by mRNA delivery. And what they do is develop a messenger RNA that in the hematopoietic stem cell will make a CRISPR protein that will target BCL11A. And whether this ultimately will prove to be the long-sought in vivo gene therapy, I can't tell you. So stay in touch. Hopefully, I'll come back here in a year or so and give you an update. But start reading the literature. And more importantly, start thinking about how these technologies can be brought to where they are really needed, which is right here. Right now, these commercial therapies are going to cost a million dollars or more. And that is untenable. So the goal, and it will be achieved, I am convinced, is more in vivo hematopoietic stem cell gene therapy, which doesn't yet exist robustly, so that one can correct the sickle cell mutation in one or another ways that I have described, but done in such a way that it would involve administration of some kind of complex, perhaps a lipid nanoparticle, perhaps a virus that would target hematopoietic stem cells and reverse enough or tr the disease. So I need to end with somewhat of an apology. This stuff is complicated. <laughs> I wish it were easier to explain the role of BCL11A, the locus control region, and all the parts of these vectors. But what I hope you realize is that, yes, the disease is complicated. The therapies are going to be complicated. But they can be developed. And hopefully, in a dozen years or so, we will have routine gene therapy for sickle cell disease, for beta thalassemia, for other diseases of the blood forming system that could be administered routinely to populations anywhere in the world. So thank you, and I'll be happy to take questions. I get to sit down. OK. I'm sure you have questions. So, um, Prof is ready to take questions. So, let's, sh let's show by hands if you have a question.
Thank you. Good morning, Prof. Um, I'm Fidelis. Uh, please, I wanted to find out, since the gene editing is done ex, viv uh, ex vivo, uh, would it, it be recognized as an immunogen by the patient's immune uh, system and elicit uh, immune response? And if so, how were those challenges um, taken care of? Can hear me. Um, yeah, in the example I cited, you're introducing one amino acid change in hemoglobin. That is very unlikely to be mutagenic or immunogenic. And in any case, it could be controlled by, by steroids, at least at the beginning. But I can tell you, um, David Liu is generating base changers that will convert the valine back to the normal amino acid. So hang in there. It could actually happen. He is an organic chemist and one of these geniuses in developing new technologies. I am told, but don't know the evidence, that he can actually do it. But in any case, hemoglobin makassar is considered non-pathogenic, and many people in this Indonesian island, uh, Makassar is the capital of, I forget the name of the Indonesian island, have it, and they're perfectly normal. All right. I have some other few questions. Okay, so um, since with the stem cells, there are other original stem cells that will be present in the bone marrow, which will definitely differentiate into erythrocytes. When the edited ones are introduced, what mechanisms are used such that they proliferate faster and differentiate into more erythrocytes than the original ones? Um, the evidence is the gene-edited stem cells have normal functions. That is, their job is to divide, maintain stem cells, and generate progenitors of the other lineages. How much red cell is, are made is controlled by the body at a totally different level, where the level of blood oxygen is monitored by kidney cells. And if blood oxygen is low, these kidney cells secrete erythropoietin that stimulates more red cell production. So red cell levels are completely independent of stem cells per se. So that would not be a concern. The concern is that the progeny would make the right hemoglobin. Right. But I can see why you're concerned, and these are issues that others have raised. Right. OK, so the last question. Um, particularly interested in this because I'm a carrier. Um, so I want to know, is there, are there plans to develop therapy for carriers because we, we don't want to be too careful in choosing partners. It's, it's a problem. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> the, the answer is no. And the reason is, I mean, you look completely normal to me. And you know, unless you have a pathology, there's no reason to even think about gene therapy. But prenatal testing becomes crucial. And you know, that, as I described in one of my earlier lectures, you know, with proper guidance can eliminate genetic diseases. But um, it creates a lot of social issues as well. Um, you know you're a carrier, you know what to do. Yes, so we know we have viewers online. So if you're online and have a question, please, you can indicate that then we will allow you to. 
the chat. Yes, you can indicate it in the chat and then you'll be responded to for the viewers online. Yeah, hello. Hello, Prof. Can somebody take a picture of this? <laughs> I just want to show my family. Yeah, hello. My name is... Oh, I see you. My name is Richmond Apana, Enfold by Medical Science. Uh, I want to find out, after their family lost their two children to the deficiencies, they reach out to the Boston children for trial, clinical trials. I want to know the therapy for thalassemia, the long term and its consequences for those who undergo the therapy. I want to find out the therapy for the thalassemia, the clinical trial, and the long term outcome for patients who undergo or undergone the, for the treatment, what to be the, the long-term consequences on such patients? If I understand the question, how do you find out the long-term consequences yes, for those of these? Um, the actual gene therapy is done at a number of centers now where they have the facilities for stem cell transplants. And the children are generally sent home to live normal lives, but they have their own physician or hematologist who will do a whole prescribed set of tests and communicate on a yearly basis with the physicians at the lead hospital, mostly Boston children. So if there are any complications, the child is sent back to Children's Hospital. It could be Necker in Paris, uh, Sick Kids in Toronto. There are a handful of, of hospitals that do these gene therapies. So they are followed long term. And particularly, as I described, uh, to be sure that they do not have leukemias. And in fact, DNA tests are done to look at the sites in the stem cells and their daughter cells at which the virus inserted. In other words, if there were activation of an oncogene, you would see among all the sites in the genome where the lentivirus inserted, you would have a predominance of nearby oncogenes. And so far, that has not happened. So besides clinical evaluations, they look at DNA in the white blood cells from these patients to see if there's any chance they could develop leukemia in the future. So it's still an ongoing clinical trial. And my understanding is for instance, with the Bluebird gene therapy, they've already undergone phase three and have FDA approval. But my understanding is the FDA requires what is called a phase four, which is continual clinical monitoring of these patients, even with an approved therapy, just to look for exactly what you're concerned about. So it's still very much an experimental procedure, even though it has been approved by the FDA. Thank you, Prof. I'm Hubert Kwame Agbogli, uh, MPhil student. My concern has always been how these therapies can reach the most vulnerable groups. Because from the lab, yes, the, the cost involved, how do you reach the most vulnerable groups with some of these challenges, uh, therapies, sorry, thank you. No, it's a hugely important problem. Um, as it happened four years ago, it was arranged for me to have a dinner with Bill Gates. 
And at the dinner, we discussed exactly what you are concerned about. At the time, these gene therapies were looking to be effective. And the Gates Foundation now supports, with NIH, somewhere around $500 million of effort to develop in vivo gene therapies, something that would be fairly straightforward to manufacture. Perhaps lipid nanoparticles that I was just describing that contained in them a messenger RNA for a CRISPR protein and a guide RNA that would target the BCL11A enhancer. In other words, those RNAs could be put in a lipid nanoparticle with the right lipids and other things one could imagine targeting to hematopoietic stem cells. There are groups working on it. And ideally, these would not require, they do not require a stem cell transplant. So at least we get them out of major medical centers with elaborate clinical facilities. Then to get the cost down, that's a separate issue. Uh, to get the manufacturing done near where they're administered is yet another issue but I am convinced it will be solved. And in fact, I would encourage people here to find out more details about the NIH program, some of the companies that are working in it. There's also a group I can tell you that is collaboratively between MIT, Mass General, and Children's Hospital that have one of these Gates grants that are trying to develop lipid nanoparticles. It's the PhD thesis of a student. I'm on her advisory board. You know, if that technology works, MIT could license it on a non-exclusive basis, you see. That would be the key. You'd license it on a non-exclusive basis to any company that convinces the MIT Licensing Bureau that they can develop the technology. That would work. You see, we're not there yet, but there are ways it can be made to work. Um, okay, sir, I'm, I'm Daniel, and my question here is... I, where are you? I'm right here. Right here. Oh, there you are. Hi. Okay. <laughs> okay, sir. I just want to know why um, sickle cell is um, so common in um, malaria endemic regions. Why is it endemic in malaria rich regions? And it's long been known that carriers, that is, individuals with one, you have two beta globin genes. If one of them is sickle and the other is wild type, you're a carrier. And because of the amount of beta S protein that's in these red cells, the malaria parasite has trouble growing. So in brief, carriers of sickle cell disease tend to resist infection by malaria than individuals with two wild-type beta globin genes. And in fact, I've seen maps, several countries, most recently Uganda, where there's an incredible correlation between the incidence of sickle cell trait and sickle cell disease and the incidence of malaria. So individuals who live in these areas or their descendants will be carried. And similarly, beta thalassemia, because of the absence of beta globin and the lability of the red cells, those cells don't do well for the malaria parasite. All right, thank you. Um, I have another question to ask. Um, you talked about the pains that um, um, sickle cell patients do go through, the excruciating pains, and you mentioned the fact that it's due to oxygen deprivation to some part of the body. 
I just want to know the underlying mechanism that do cause the pain. Yeah, I'm not an expert. I know there are experts here who actually work with sickle cell patients who probably can answer that. Um, anybody? <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, I believe it's it's the lack of oxygen and the obstruction of current organs, but as I said, I'm not a clinician. Are there other questions? Yes. I, I see some. The response to walking them, I'll, I'll come out. <laughs> okay, so um, the pain is as a result of, just as you rightly said, um, the problem with oxygen distribution to the body. Now, this comes as a result of the fact that when the then when the hemoglobin, you know, contains um, any mutations, now the deformability of the red cells reduces. And for that matter, the red cells are unable to meander its way through the capillaries. And so if they block the capillaries, they prevent blood from circulating to the other side of the body. So in this case, two things happen. Either ischemic and then hyposia happens. Now, the another problem with the sickle cell crisis is as a result of what you call preprism. And that is the, is, in fact, it is a pathophysiologic condition that enables the sickle cell, especially, in fact, it's more common in males, and it causes them to sustain erection for a very long time. And that erection will, it will not be like the physiological erection that you have, you know, if you want, really want to erect. But in this case, it comes as a result of a painful um, pressure that is subjected to the pelvic area, and it is quite uh, painful. And it's all as a result of the ability of the red cells to block the capillaries, and for that matter, blood flow in and out will be ineffective. And this is one of the mechanisms why yeah. it happens. And then yeah. cytokines, also proliferation of the cytokines also leads to this kind of crisis that the sickle cell patient goes through, aside anemia and other um, um, I, um, issues. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Please, I'm Priscilla Esando. Please, I have some um, few questions and then maybe. <laughs> okay, so please. Um, from the presentation, um, I learned that um, it has been established that sickle cell, appear, sickle cell disease appears days after birth in, in children, like humans, it appears days after birth. So I am thinking if um, there will be a, a way or some markers that can be um, identified or seen in the fetus so that we will do a more fetal gene therapy to um, actually ah. cure or then prevent such diseases. Ah, a wonderful question. Could you detect sickle cell disease in the fetus? The answer is yes. I'm not sure it's been done. And gene therapy in a fetus would be rather difficult. On the other hand, gene therapy immediately after birth would make a lot of sense, particularly if it could be done in vivo, that is with something like a lipid nanoparticle. My understanding, and again, I'm not an expert, is that it is often difficult to detect sickle cell disease until a few months because of the slow accumulation of beta S. But 
there are ways of doing rapid DNA tests that can be now done on strips of paper using a variant of polymerase chain reaction that works at room temperature to identify whether a patient has a wild type gene, a beta S gene, or both. And I know of groups that are actually developing it, including one of my own students who's doing it as a thesis in a different lab. So that would go a long way to doing what you want, which is getting the child as soon as possible. Because as, I mean, sadly, many children die in infancy because of infections caused by sepsis as a consequence. So the earlier the diagnosis, the better. And certainly in many countries, the diagnosis, the cost of the diagnosis, my understanding, is too high. So getting simpler diagnosis would work. But I don't see the advantage of fetal gene therapy for this disease. For other diseases, I could see it. For diseases like skid, I could see it. Yes, please. Um, please. Um, uh, this, this one too is something that I've been thinking about. That um, I'm glad you were thinking about <laughs> it. I'm serious. Yes, I think please. these are important questions. Yes, please. I've been thinking about this. And um, I also realized oh, a, a situation that I saw that um, the patient was actually went in for a genotype test. And then the person was actually... Yeah, I'm having trouble hearing you without a microphone. Okay, so sorry about that. So um, I was saying that I know a patient who went to the hospital, someone who went to the hospital and did a genotype and then was actually given the results as AA. But the person was having anemia and all those things and then they later did other tests and they were like, it's beta thalassemia. So I, I just want to... Yeah, you can have both. Okay, so the person can be yeah, diagnosed with beta thalassemia, but yeah, it's now beta to, thalassemia yeah. is also a very bad disease. Um, I've seen many patients in Sri Lanka, and again, it's quite debilitating. Okay. Thank you. Please, my name is Wanda. Um, please, I want to ask that those who contract the bubble boy disease or the severe combined immunodeficiency disease, uh, it talks about the, they've been deficient in ABA, which is the adenosine deaminase. I understand very well. So can there also be a case that they do not have the ABA at all? And talking about the therapies, now the one that you presented on, talks about replacement of the enzyme, the ADA enzyme. And I also want to ask that if they have it in deficient, can there be a therapy now or even in the future that deals with uh, multiplying the lesser amount of the uh, enzyme that they have in their body and not talking about the replacement of the enzyme? Is it I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, in severe combined immune deficiency, uh, it's loss of function. It's mutations that completely inactivate that gamma receptor chain. So the only rational alternative, and patients have different mutations in the gene that cause loss of function. So trying to edit those kinds of genetic defects don't make too much sense. The alternative is really replacing the gene itself. And that's what's done in these gene therapies. Um, does that answer the question? Yes, please. Thank you. I'm sure there are questions on this side of the room. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Please, I'm Gloria. My question is... W where are you? Ah, hi. My question is, you said that career people of sickle cell, they are not supposed, they are supposed to be normal. But then I want to know why some express some of the symptoms that the diseased people also express. Yeah, again, I'm not a clinician. But I do know that people with sickle cell trait have difficulty at high altitudes. And it's, for instance, they're not, at least in the United States, they're not allowed to pilot airplanes. So there may be reasons why they have problems under certain conditions. Again, I'm not a clinician. Can some, someone may be able to answer that question. I don't know. Whether people with the trait have problems under certain conditions. Okay. Are we done? Oh, we have questions from the... Yes. So um, there are two questions here um, from the same person. The first question is, um, are there different approaches to gene therapy for these conditions? If so, what are they? Different approaches. For which gene? For gene therapy. Yeah. Well, the answer is yes. Is I As I tried to emphasize, for sickle cell disease, there are at least four approaches that are moving forward. And each of them have their advantages and their disadvantages. Which one will ultimately win out, if any, we don't know. Uh, the main concern is side effects. I stress the issue of leukemogenesis with the lentiviruses. That probably is not going to be an issue, but we'll see. I was very enthusiastic about the CRISPR technologies. Both of them do have off-target effects. That is, the Cas9 that cuts a target DNA, there's some evidence that is good that it will cut at other random sites in the genome. And to what extent, if any, that's going to affect the use of that in, say, the gene therapy I described, we'll have to see. Again, it's going to be a balance between treating a large number of people and having a side effect that may affect a few or more. Um, I talked about the base editor, which doesn't involve a nuclease. But again, you have an enzyme floating in the cell that deaminates adenosine. It, too, is said to have nonspecific side effects. That is, random adenosines may be changed to inosines. Whether that is of material consequence, we'll have to see. So a lot of what's moving, a lot of what needs and is being done on these gene therapies is safety as well as efficacy. And again, for a lethal disease like SCID, you may be t more tolerant of side effects than you would for sickle cell anemia, which, although painful, it's not immediately lethal. Your lifespan is short. So there's always going to be a trade-off. And safety is always the first thing that's on clinicians' minds. And it's also one thing that's going to be on, on every patient's mind. If you tell a young person you're going to get gene therapy, they're going to ask about all these questions. So the, next, the last question here is, um, are there ongoing clinical trials um, exploring combination therapies, such as gene therapy along other treatments um, for better outcomes? 
Um, my understanding is that patients who are getting their ongoing therapies for sickle cell disease, such as hydroxyurea, that continues because the objective initially is to look at replacement of the hemoglobin S by fetal hemoglobin and so on. One of the criteria, and I mentioned it in a couple of cases, is, for instance, in beta thalassemia, do the patients require fewer transfusions? You see, that would be an endpoint in a clinical trial. You would look at the level of beta globin as one criteria, but the primary goal, the, the primary target of the clinical trial is whether the patients maintain a normal hemoglobin and don't need blood transfusions, because that is the, dam the damaging part of the beta thalassemia therapy. Okay, please, my name is Christopher. Please, my name is Christopher. My question is about the sickle cell, the mutation. Could you speak into the microphone, please? The sickle cell mutation, the gene, does it interact with other genes that could worsen other conditions? And if yes, what are some of these conditions? I'm not sure I understand. I mean, sickle cell disease impacts lots of body functions. And again, I'm not a clinician, but I can imagine combined with other diseases, it could be very serious. I, again, you'd need an, a clinician to answer that question. I was talking about the gene. It said there is a mutation with the um, glutamine and then valine yeah. proteins. So I was saying a gene that has been mutated or exchanged, does it interact with other genes in the genome? Ah, ah, ah. No. I mean, simply put, the gene itself is a sequence of nucleic acids. The, the globin genes exist as a large chromosome loop that is regulated by the locus control region. So in general, a mutation of the sort that's in sickle cell disease would not affect the adjacent globin genes and probably would not affect at least in the same cell, other gene expressions. But obviously, sickle cell disease causes lots of metabolic changes in all cells, many cells. And in that way, it affects other genes, but not in the erythroid cell itself. OK, so before you come in, and um, we should be running up. So. Um, let me see those who have questions, so I give you numbers. Wow. You see why we should, we should start early? <laughs> so, one, I'm, I'm going to take the first four I can see. One, two, and first person to raise their, second person to raise their hand, yeah, three, <laughs> and then four there, okay? If we have any other questions, you can interact with Harvey afterwards. My name is Augustine, level 200 um, biochemistry. Where, where are you? Oh, there you are. Okay. Please, um, during the lecture, you made mention of um, base editing where the valine error in the um, sickle cell is changed to the alanine. But from the idea of biochemistry, we understand that Valine and alanine has this kind of chemical properties, which is very close in terms of its um, side chain hydrophobicity. So, how is. Yeah. Um, valine and alanine have similar chemical properties. The point is, normal indiv individuals 
who have the alanine in that position have no pathology. That's the key point. And that's why conversion of beta S to this hemoglobin Makassar seems okay. In other words, the human clinical trial has been done. There are lots of people on the island of Sulawesi where Makassar is located. I happen to have been to Makassar, but that's a different story. They're normal people, you see. So we have the clinical data from people that it's almost certainly going to be okay to change in Makassar. But again, David is working on ways of changing it back to the normal amino acid. And that's work in progress. And if he can do that and get it into something that could be delivered to a stem cell, that may well be the next step. Okay, thanks. And looking at the, the fetal um, hemoglobin, we say we have... Um, the gamma globin instead of the beta globin when the child is, um, the fetus is still in the mother's womb. But now the person is suffering with a mutation in the beta globin and we are now trying to stimulate the expression of the gamma globin. Where we have, we know that that efficiency or the um, cooperative ability of that gamma globin in oxygen intake is very low. Yeah. Gamma globin binds oxygen tighter than beta globin. And that's to allow the fetus to get the oxygen from the mother. But the evidence is that combined with other hemoglobins, the patients do okay. In other words, yes, you might be concerned with the minutia of oxygen transport but the patients seem to do quite well with a significant amount of fetal hemoglobin as adults. And again, there's earlier evidence, individuals with as much as 10% fetal hemoglobin seem normal. The operative word is seem. So right now, it looks like a very good approach. And we'll see if something adverse happens over time, one would reevaluate. But right now, it looks like a good approach. And it's also simple because it would use CRISPR. And it would be a one time genetic modification that would not involve insertion of any DNA into the chromosome. So that's why people are looking hard at that technology. But again, this is evolving. And the key, as you're alluding to, is side effects. OK. Um, I'm Benedicta, um, third year. Please, I'm here. <laughs> third year biochemistry student, undergrad. My questions are, um, first of all, can gene therapies be done for sickle cell patients, and uh, you mentioned a 16-year-old having a therapy. So can any, therapy, any of the therapies be done for patients that are lower than 16 years? And if so, are there consequences that can come about as a result of that? And yeah, let me, let me just stop there. Um, it is unusual to do clinical trials on children. That requires separate administrative issues. In the first gene therapy trials, um, it was limited to patients over 18 who in the United States are legally able to give consent. In other words, at 18 in the United States, you're considered an adult and you make your own medical decisions. So the way NIH mandated the clinical trials at Children's Hospital is first to administer it to adults over 18. Once those were completed and the results looked good, 
they allow Children's Hospital <coughs> to do clinical trials on individuals between 12 and 18. They required their parents' consent, but also these adolescents were deemed able to give consent themselves. In other words, they had to agree to it. Finally, it was given to children under 12, in which case only the parent needed to consent. And this creates ethical issues, as I'm sure you can imagine, because parents can make gene therapy decisions for their children that might have adverse consequences when the children are adults. But as I understand the legal system now, that is the way it works. So adolescents who are certainly targets for these gene therapies, um, it's both their, at least in the United States, both their parents and the adolescent themselves have to give consent. And I've heard, I, I've, I've been privileged to sit in on one of these sessions, which is long and takes several hours, because a typical 16-year-old doesn't understand fetal globin transitions and locus control elements and everything else, you see. But it is definitely an issue that is faced. Okay, my last question is, you made mention of the BCL11A gene that represses the synthesis of the female fetal hemoglobin. And then you also said that it plays a role in the neuron and B lymphocyte development. So when these um, therapies are done to repress the BCL11A gene, which will repress fetal hemoglobin, does it, um, doesn't it affect other parts of the, like, does it bring about any other problems? Because you said it plays a role in neuron and lymphocyte yeah, development. Yeah. yeah, you have to not, you're, you're absolutely right, and I tried to emphasize it. You have to knock down BCL11A only in erythroid cells. And that, as I hope I convinced you, can be done in one of two ways. One is use CRISPR to cut the erythroid-specific enhancer of BCL11A. That was shown experimentally to block BCL11A induction in erythroid cells, but not in any other body cell. So that's the first point. The second was using the shRNA, the inhibitory RNA, which knocks down the BCL11A message. But the transcription of that hairpin RNA occurs only in erythroid cells. So in two different ways, we can repress synthesis of BCL11A, but only in erythroid cells so that there would not be an effect on nerve cells and so forth. Um, I assume, given this, that the patients are monitored by neurologists. You see, I mean, if they're not, they should be. You see, to be sure that what you're concerned about doesn't happen. And this is all part of clinical trials in developing these new therapies. And also, I should have mentioned, when you plan such a clinical trial, and you plan ultimately to market it as a therapeutic, you have to negotiate with the FDA, which regulates this. And you have a discussion what do I need to show? What side effects are you guys worried about? What do I have to do 
in a clinical trial, not only for efficacy, but for safety. You see, so it, it's an elaborate process. Certainly in the States, it costs $30,000, $40,000 per patient per clinical trial because you need an army of clinicians to check out the patient. <coughs> so a lot of you have questions, but fortunately for us, the afternoon section is just a student interaction. So just note your question down. When, we back, when you are back in the afternoon, you can then ask your questions. But we would have to break now because we are out of time. Yeah. We've done an hour of q and <laughs> I'm very impressed that you guys have this many very good questions. So, again, I, I really want to congratulate the people who have taught you all. Okay. Um, so, thank you very much for coming. Um, how many of you here have registered for the afternoon session? Raise your hand. Great. How many of you have actually read the papers we sent to you? <laughs> okay, well, wait, wait, you're not off the hook. I love the fact that a lot of you are coming. What we're going to do is discuss the two key papers in hemophilia gene therapy. I am losing my voice. I am going to want you guys, volunteers, I will put a figure from the paper on the screen. I can go into elaborate detail about what the figure is, but I'm not going to do it. I'm going to want volunteers from you guys. This is the way we run seminars at MIT. I love teaching a seminar class because I do a little of the talking and the students do a lot. So come prepared to talk about either the paper itself, why is this paper important, what does it show, and go through the individual figures. I'll help you but I'm going to want volunteers. <coughs> <coughs> you can see I'm losing my voice. I will want volunteers to come up and talk about these figures in the paper. That's okay? Good. See you all at 2 o'clock. But before you go, um, I just want to introduce uh, the founding vice chancellor, Professor Fred Binker, who joined us while the seminar was going on. Yes. All right, so thank you very much. We'll see you at two. <laughs>